Okay, good afternoon and good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome back to Coast to Coast EVs, your fortnightly fast charge on EVs and infrastructure. Uh, fun one tonight. We uh, Obviously, last time we were on live, nothing much had happened. For once, we didn't get news breaking the second we went live, but uh, this time, the day after, thankfully, uh, so we got to cover our previous topic, the uh, Ford Tesla news, and uh, the adapters started rolling out, and all hell broke loose, as we will uh, <laughs> cover in depth later on in the show. But uh, for the moment, uh, Coast to Coast TVs is uh, slowly expanding across the coast to coast of uh, podcast platforms. I think I've got us on Apple Podcasts. If you use uh, an iPhone or uh, any kind of device on Apple's ecosystem, check it out. See if you can find us there. Uh, we're on Spotify, Amazon Music, and a bunch of others. So uh, take a listen, subscribe, leave us a review, and uh, that's usually going out the next day um, around lunchtime Eastern, depending on whether I sleep in or not. Um, so Mr. Eric Way of the News Coolum Channel, um, okay. Mr. Walter Schultze of the Network Architect Channel, uh, how are you both doing? Doing okay. Well, good, 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 good. And uh, we are before we get uh, too far into this, um, leave your live chat comments. We're uh, always scouring that for questions. I do my best to keep up as best I can. And obviously, uh, we have the uh, good fine folks of the Marquee Vlog on later on here, so we'll want uh, plenty of chatter for them. So uh, any questions, leave that in. But we start with the news, which is gravity-defying. Um, yeah. If you haven't heard, a small company called Gravity, which is backed by a very large company called Google, um, lit up 24 charges in the New York City, um, not just area, but right in the uh, kind of midtown area, right by Times Square. So I used to live in Brooklyn and was uh, not too far from Manhattan. So this is an area which is not, you know, renowned for its uh, lots of space and big open uh, places to put DC fast charging. Um, I got some pictures here, but uh, who wants to talk about 500 kilowatt charging here first? Eric, do you want to take a shot? Yeah, yeah, sure. And I, I was just hoping that you got some sleep before you went to Brooklyn. So no, but... no sleep to Brooklyn. Yeah, yeah. We've it's been like having some musical. Keep on, keep us. Yeah, going. we've been having some musical jabs back and forth, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, um, the thing that strikes me about this is I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about 500 kilowatt. Uh, you know, just because the only limitations for Electrify America, EVgo, these other companies is just how many power modules they're putting in, right? So you see a 350 kilowatt charger, it's because it can provide 500 amps up to 700 volts. But there's nothing stopping it from charging all the way up to 500 amps at 1,000 volts, which would be 500 kilowatts. The only limitation is they didn't put enough modules in the cabinet to actually facilitate that. So it looks like this did. Um, but the other thing that I really like about this gravity or <laughs> gravity-defying uh, charging is that it really is leaning into an aspect that we haven't seen with charging yet, which is you don't need to put chargers where you, like you do gas, uh, gas pumps. You can locate them pretty much anywhere. You can embed them in a wall. We've seen with Electrify America's recent uh, flagship site in San Francisco, you can put them completely indoors, right? You don't need to, to, you can break all sorts of rules with chargers that you can't do with gas pumps, including mounting them to the ceiling. And like you were mentioning, there's a lot of times where your space constraint and things like that, you know, you have this ability to put these chargers out of the way. And then also, even though those do look like Huber plus Sooner cables, they, they, I have to imagine they are far easier to manage and handle simply because they're being held overhead. And so you're, you're only holding up the amount of cable that would normally reach down to the ground. So I think there's a lot of interesting aspects to this implication. Um, but then again, what we're seeing is just one more billion dollar company literally getting into the charging game. And so with Google you know, putting their weight behind it, it's really showing us that this is a real movement. It's not just, you know, what we're hearing from some companies that, oh, it's a, you know, a corner case, a niche market, whatever. These are some major corporations, some of the largest in the world that are committing to electrification, both for 
vehicles like the Amazon fleet and for charging, like we're seeing here with Google. So um, yeah, so lots of stuff, but yeah, those were my thoughts. Walter, how about you? This was one that uh, you were paying attention to, right? Yeah, so I've never lived close to Manhattan. I have walked up and down most of the island uh, during vacations and whatnot. And I pulled it up on PlugShare. If, unless I'm mistaken, there's not many DC fast chargers on the island of Manhattan. And this is one of the few. So kudos for them for perforating a charging desert. And they seem to be building it, uh, attracting ride sharing. And in a major metropolitan area, ride sharing is a thing and they need places to charge their electric vehicles. What I'm trying to do is piece together what Google's play is with EV charging. As Eric says, it's a growing market, but I don't think that's their sole reason. There's a lot of Google automotive embedded in cars nowadays. And if they're targeting ride shares, I question if they're venturing into autonomy spaces. Uh, playing some kind of long game in order to build out major metropolitan charging hubs for ride shares and eventually turn that over to autonomy. But I know that Google has initiatives corporate wide in order to lower their carbon footprint as well. So they may be simply trying to offset uh, carbon emissions through using DC fast charger credits or something. I don't really know how the economics of that work, but I do know that they are investing in green energy technology in many different sectors. So this might just be an ex uh, an extension of those programs. So I'm still a little bit unclear exactly what Google's intentions are, if this is just philanthropic uh, investing, or if they have some business uh, purpose behind uh, trying to invest in uh, EV charging technology. And it kind of makes sense because they have, th their purpose in life is to gather data. And the embedded, systems in cars uh, track people's locations. They track, They do lots of things. They, they, there's privacy restrictions and all that. They, they could obfuscate the data and get metadata and uh, do lots of things with that. That's what pays their bills. Uh, you think Gmail is free. It's not free. <laughs> you're, just, you're just offering, offering Google uh, a means of uh, supporting themselves uh, by doing Gmail, which I'm fine with. Um, so Really, my question is in the tech, as Eric uh, explained, is very cool. The uh, cable management, the using of the cooling of the building in order to use cooling for the hardware. I don't know what kind of hardware that is, if it's custom built or if it's uh, commercial off the shelf units. I couldn't quite uh, piece that together in the information that I saw, but definitely interesting. And as Eric says, I'll definitely echo that what we're looking at is one of a long list of large companies uh, perforating the idea that EVs are a niche market, that they are very clearly getting heavily invested in in multiple different directions. And this is just another one with a Fortune 50 company showing up with a very large purse. Yep, for sure. Um... The, the hardware was certainly an interesting piece of it. I mean, you obviously saw the headlines immediately jumping to 500 kilowatts OMG, you know, as the hyperbole kind of uh, indicated there in the, the headline. But the, the piece of it that's interesting to me is more what we were discussing on the previous podcast, which is that location. You know, I mean, obviously, of course, you want, you know, fast charging in cities. And to your question, Walter, there is very little fast charging in New York City as a whole. Manhattan is very, very poorly served, um, getting better with some of the uh, the curbside charging that they're implementing there. But that's for a future episode. Um, the more interesting part is where it is, because, I mean, rideshare would make sense there. You certainly do want to be in and out and, you know, charging very quickly. But as a, you know, if you think about parking garage, you don't think. I need 500 kilowatts. You think that's for somebody who's staying for the day, who's, uh, you know, maybe going for at least two or three hours. I know I've driven into the center of Manhattan, parked the car and left it at a charge point and come back to a full charge because, you know, there's quite a lot to do in New York City, contrary to popular belief. There's, uh, there's some things there that you can pass the time with. So um, it was an interesting kind of just juxtaposition because you're going from, you know, as you said, very little DC fast charging to 
holy hell, there's a lot of stuff there now. There's 24, you know, uh, units there. They're all kind of neatly put away. It looks like it's obviously a test case. So, you know, if they want to push more of that out, um, it's going to be a big job. But, you know, it's it's very cool to see those kind of projects start to get uh, put in. Rideshare is obviously a big piece of it. you got Revel down in uh, Brooklyn, which is opening those super hubs. Um, so there's a bunch of stuff there that's, uh, you know, I think it's more of a case of, watch you know keep a watchful eye at the moment because i don't think that's going to be the end of it but um definitely something that as i get down there and uh, i've got a trip to new york kind of on the decks uh, i'll start to see what we can find and uh, maybe poke around yeah it's certainly put in there to support all the gmc hummer evs sold in new york city i so. just want to see that row of 500 kilowatt chargers with a bolt on every charger <laughs> going yes. to 100 percent that last 10 kilowatts <laughs> You got to go get a pretzel. That's what I hear. I think there's there's movie theaters around there as well. You might want to go to coast to coast, get to the Red Bull garage, and then just leave it parked in the charity charging. Catch up on the Oscars. Yeah. Yeah. Alrighty. Um, we are kind of obviously more focused here about Tesla. Let me jump through the and Ford. Let me jump through the comments here, and uh, we will make sure we say hello to everybody. Um, well, Maki Vogue is obviously right there. Mike Mahan in Southern California next to you guys. He's uh, some more San Diego, Tom Palmer, and Oceanside is where Maki Vlog, Craig Collins, hello from Moreno Valley, California. Hello to Eric Cottrell. Hello to Anthony. Muskegon, Michigan. Ah, I've got a bunch of uh, Michigan, Ypsilanti. We have someone who's never heard of Google, but we have heard of him, Brandon from Everyday EV. Welcome. <laughs> and have I missed anybody? Live in Brooklyn, Ryan Huber. Uh, near the Revel site. Yep, we've been down there, and uh, that's. Like, I'm glad they're starting to get those in, but there's a lot more needed. So it's interesting to see how these different uh, stations start to play out with gravity in a parking lot. The Revel site's kind of still in a enclosed lot, but it's interesting to kind of you know see how different uh, purveyors are trying to put those fast charges in. And Ryan says the worst bit in New York is that most other DCFs are in valet pay lots, even Tesla. So that's, uh, I do believe the gravity site is uh, public and is, uh, you do have to pay for the charging. I don't know what you pay for the parking. So something to keep an eye on. But also Ryan's point, uh, he bikes everywhere in the actual city. Yeah, exactly. It's um, it's mostly about, you know, it takes a lot longer to get places in the car than it does on the subway, on a bike, or even just on foot sometimes. So it's not a big place, and uh, it's quite nice to walk around as well. Alrighty, uh, let's uh, not keep ourselves waiting any longer. Um Maki Volg has been supercharging across California. If you caught the uh, the news the day after we had our last uh, live stream, uh, Patrick and Liv were all over it. That was the first channel I turned to, and they were not uh, not going to disappoint. So, without further ado, Patrick and Liv, Ooh. welcome. Hello. Hello, thank you for having us. Ah, so to you. be here. It's, um, oh, you're waiting. It a big, big topic that we have to discuss. Um, for the the one person in the comments who stumbled across and doesn't know uh, what's going on, um, could you give us a little bit about the channel? Just uh, let us know kind of where you are, what you've been up to, and then we'll get on to the kind of uh, meat of the topic. Yeah, a lot of people may know us. Um, we're called Maki Vlog, but you know we actually cover a lot of EVs, a lot of EV topics, but. We are, we have a Maki, um, and so we, we sort of document our uh, travels and adventures in the Mach-E, um, and lately, of course, the big deal has been uh, we just got access to the Tesla superchargers, so we've done a ton of content around that, visiting like the uh, the largest supercharger in the U.S., Quartzsite, Arizona. We did a road trip out there. Um, we've been doing various tests with um, you know, just trying to compare like EA, EVgo, and Tesla. Um, we met some friends so that they could try out the adapter and just trying to also like educate people 
um, on both sides. So there's we, we look at it as like we we're trying to educate Tesla people like, hi, we're we're coming and we're allowed to be here. And we're um, friendly. And we're friendly. <laughs> and, we come uh, in peace. Yeah. Also, like trying to educate uh, new Ford owners of like, how are you going to find superchargers uh, once you get there? Like, you know, how does it work? Um, and then how to be a good neighbor. Cause, uh, and I'm not talking about like, just don't leave your trash. <laughs> it, it's, it's also about like trying to position your, your Ford EV well, so that, um, we leave room for Tesla's to charge. Cause we end up in a lot of places taking two spots. Mm -hmm. For sure. And just to emphasize how much you've had going on here, I think there is the Rivian R2 and R3 reveal, which was nestled in there because you couldn't not cover that. But uh, <laughs> the other seven videos there, and there are more below it, are all uh, superchargers, how to activate your first road trip, charging at the world's largest supercharger, hula hooping at them, as is standard <laughs> in some of these places. So and the Shoopy was at a sh supercharger, so <laughs> it's, it's still really <laughs> It was charging. Yeah. <laughs> so you've been busy. Um, what? When, obviously, you kind of jumped all over it the first day, and you, you, we've all known this was coming. Um, you know, super quick background. Uh, we know this time last year, more or less, Tesla started opening up the Magic Docks in New York. That's the the stuff behind me here, speaking to, you know, Tesla and uh, positioning in slightly odd uh, locations. Um, but you know, they they started that up, and not long after, we had the uh, news that um, Ford was going to be the first uh, to adopt uh next and j3400 as it will soon be um so that was kind of may june last year and everything since then has been really the waiting game right just trying to figure out when this was going to happen um and slowly into the kind of new year we started to get word from uh, ford that they were going to look at the adapter around springtime and happily you know start of march you're here charging on um superchargers so with that kind of in the background you guys are the first among the first to receive them right this isn't like something that's gone out to a wide range of owners it's mostly kind of people who are in that inner circle of ford uh yeah and enthusiasts <laughs> patrick Springer right here yeah we were definitely among the lucky few to be able to get it and uh we still have to purchase our own, so we put in our order. Get our own for free. Yeah. <laughs> our own. Um, so I think we have an April ship date. Um, okay. but we let everyone that we know know as soon as we could immediately. And, um, yep, that is what we have and what everyone else will be having soon. Mm -hmm. And this yeah. is some of the videos here of uh, being on kind of in depth on the the latching process, how long it takes to start up. Um, yeah. You know, where you're positioning, um, all that stuff is obviously kind of second nature to us, but you've gone to the the point of really kind of re-emphasizing it, not just because there's so many videos out there that you've been, you know, wanting to make sure you cover it, but because as you say, there's there's a certain element of good neighboring, making sure that you don't um kind of take up those two stalls if you don't need to. I think at the the quartz site location you had been at it was it was you were had like 84 stores and you still parked in the one that was best you know access so um tell yeah. a little bit about your considerations as you've rolled up to these places what you've been thinking as you uh, get in there well well like in the road trip out to court site we stopped at one location um i guess it's famous because it's the one that has like the 20 chargers uh, superchargers right outside of a uh, in and out so a lot of apparently a lot of people use that one because it's a which a, is cool because it's like our first exposure to this like famous tesla place that we didn't know about <laughs> <laughs> um, but we we actually specifically like we parked before we plugged in and we did it a little bit on the video just to sort of say like hey when you when you when you roll into a supercharger you may not just want to like go and just grab whatever one um and then i was like here's what i'm looking at and there was actually a guy that was charging in one that i wanted because there was like an empty non-charging space next to him and if i would have uh parked there i could have used the charger he was using and not use but one stall um, but then looking at it, it was like, sort of like, I was sort of like walking people through like most of the time you want to try to the right. There was actually some people on the right. So then I was like, let me get down on the end, um, and make it a little bit uncomfortable if somebody wanted to park next to me so that they wouldn't like pull in and go like, oh no, I can't use this one. So we, we try to explain some of that and try to just look to see where we can park, um, uh, a lot of people have said, why don't you just use like uh, a court site? They had to pull through spots. And I'm like, in that case, 
Like, yes, that would have been perfect. I would have only used one stall. But then if somebody comes in with a trailer or even a big bike rack, they're going to be like, hey, he's he's taken to one spot I could have used. So we just found one on the end. We technically like blocked um, or parked over like a walkway, mm -hmm. but it was zero of 84 being used and uh there, it was a big big wide area so it, it's just sort of you know like looking out and then um the other thing that we always emphasize is if you see a lightning or a maki go park right next to them because if they are they are actually using two spots well if you park next to them it would be two cars using three spots and if it's uh three of you it'd be three using four so your your percentage impact is reduced um and, and just, you know, the same thing as well. Like we're trying to like emphasize, like you can use the apps. Like we've been using the Chargeway app because it's very easy to um, like see where the Tesla superchargers are at and see how they're different from the EA chargers. But um, one of the keys is that they show you um, how busy it is right now. So it's a quick and easy way. And, and we can do it with the Tesla app as well. Some people want to avoid anything Tesla and, and creating a Tesla account. Um, so it's sort of like Chargeway. If you're going to have that on your phone, here's a good use for it. Mm -hmm. And I know so, there's several of them uh, cheering you on in the comments as you uh, point yes. out Chargeway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, these are very helpful. Helpful. yeah I, and it's it's it, a great. It's a, I think you made the point in one of the videos that it's one of the easiest to kind of visually understand where these um, these locations are, and that's going to be important. I want to make sure I get Walter and Eric in because I'm sure they're chomping at the bit as well. But um, you know, it's going to be important because not every site is available, right? There's, there's some here that first of all the V2 and V3 divide, but also not every V3 has opened right away. Um, right. Maybe we want to get into that a bit later. I want to make sure Walter and Eric have some sure. airtime here to question you. <laughs> Go ahead, chaps. Oh, well, I, I was just going to say, too, because I think, Patrick, Liv, that was an interesting point because you're using Chargeway. Uh, but with Ford, especially with like the Mach-E, it seems like you don't need the Tesla app at all because this has been something that i keep hearing over and over again people concerned with oh does tesla have our data oh does this you know and so with the mock e it seems like it's very straightforward it's very streamlined all within the ford ecosystem uh and that's a question for me where supposedly gm is going to be getting access soon but the bolt ev doesn't support that native plug-in charge so if that's the case you know walter might be able to plug his lyric right in and, and no, no problems, it's seamless, but I might be required to use the app in the same way that Magic Doc does. So yeah, it's kind of a weird, <laughs> a, yeah. a weird thing. And, and we did one of the videos that was up, um, we sort of demoed like there's four different ways with the Mach-E to, to activate plug and charge. So some of it will translate to, to other vehicles, but um, plug and charge is great, it's the easiest. Um, then we also were able to use the Tesla app and activate. And if you want to join the, the get the Tesla membership, that's the way to do it because then you could pay your like $13 a month and then get the, the Tesla rate versus the non Tesla per kilowatt hour rate. Um, but then also like, because it's integrated with uh, the, 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 the car, uh, I can actually like activate from my, the screen in the car we have a, an app now it's now called public charging but it's called charge assist so that makes it easy so i can just like i'm at stall 5a at the supercharger and activate um and then the final way is with the ford pass app i can do the same thing pick which station i'm at and activate um i think for most people you know well i mean obviously plug and charge to e is the easiest but really it's if you if you have a ccs car you're sort of used to getting out your phone and, and activating or something like that. So I don't think it's going to be that much of a, a leap to, to, you know, for it to be used on whether it's Rivian or bolts or whatever, if they don't support plug and charge out of the box. Yeah. And Walter, you've uh, taken several Tesla road trips, even not, not that long ago, even you typically rent them for your business trips, right? Um, what are you hoping to see from this experience as your Cadillac Lyric kind of gains access? Are you planning to use the superchargers a bunch? Do you expect it to be a backup? Where are you going with this? Many things I could say here. First of all, welcome, uh, Patrick and Liv. Thank much appreciate for you joining uh the coverage that you guys have been doing i've been living vicariously through you and just been ex 
extremely excited for this paradigm shift that we're in the process of going through as EV enthusiasts and as a nation. I really, I think there's a, there's a lot of positives coming out. I think there had been a bit of tribalism around Tesla and non-Tesla. And I almost wonder, we're talking about uh, being polite with uh, butting up against and the charge port door and positioning in spaces and everything. I actually think this will do a lot to break down that whole concept of tribalism between the Teslas and non-Teslas. And we're just all gonna be EV people who are needing a charge and going to one place or another. So that seems to be one of the uh, benefits from expansion of supercharger access that uh, we are likely going to uh, experience. And maybe I'm just speculating, but it kind of feels like there's a little bit perforation of that tribalism that had existed and much more uh, inclusiveness. And maybe you guys are picking up the same thing. I'm not sure if you have felt that or not. Oh, definitely. I think uh, that's honestly one of the things I'm the most excited about is like just breaking down the whole us versus them thing. Like EV charging needs to be uh, something that we all work to solve. Uh, it, it shouldn't be proprietary. So that's the most exciting thing. And it's kind of interesting because we've seen uh, Teslas have challenges at two stations so far. Because remember that in and out station, there was someone who had a bike mount on the back and they had to have their passenger hop out and check that they were parked okay. And then we actually had a meetup this past weekend and the person who was backing up crashed their bike rack into the sign when they, yeah. So it's like, it's not like it's a perfect situation necessarily for Tesla owners too. So like including all these other vehicles now brings a whole new conversation point of like how to make these charging stations accessible for everyone. And obviously the V4 with the longer cables or um, extensions or whatever is gonna evolve, this is gonna be more inclusive for everyone, including Tesla owners, so that they can back up with their bike rack and not worry and not have to have their passenger go look at it or crash into the sign. Yeah. Everyone yeah. that was watching, yeah. so they're like yeah. universal. Oh. Well, and, 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 you know, sorry, go ahead, Walt. Well, I'm sorry. Um, go ahead, Steve. No, no, after you. Um, so I was uh, thinking that the uh, this is gonna be one of the <clears throat> unattended benefits of you know just the process of people com conversing at charging stations, like you're saying. But to answer Steve's question about which I'm going to be using and I actually own two EVs. Um, well, I own a car that I get to drive on a daily basis, which is the Volvo. And my wife gets to drive the Lyric and she sometimes lets me drive it, just not very often. And I think it's two different situations. For the Lyric, I get free charging at uh, this station right up here and all other EV goes for two years. So it's pretty hard not to stay EV go centric with a GM car. Uh, you're also going to get discounted pricing. So that's kind of like their native brand sort of thing. But for the Volvo, it's a different story. The charge port door is in the driver's rear, which is the same as a Tesla. And right now I've got an EVgo plus max for 14 a month and I get discounted rates somewhere between 25 cents per kilowatt hour to 35 cents per kilowatt hour. And for me, that kind of works. But with a charge port door in the right place and getting Tesla rates at Tesla superchargers, I'm definitely questioning if I would switch my membership because I'm not going to get memberships in everything. I'm going to choose something to get memberships for my Volvo. And it's um, right now I'm thinking it's going to be Tesla, but I don't know for sure I'm still kind of debating but right now that is where my decision is pointing that we'll stay native EV go with the uh, GM Cadillac uh, Lyric and for the Volvo XC40 recharge I'll likely get a membership with the uh, Tesla um, and someone had asked about uh, the economics of it um, which I think we do want to touch on because I think that's it hasn't been quite as much uh, covered but you know a 1299 membership is what gets you the the cheaper rates on the superchargers right I think typically what I've seen at the magic dock around 50 55 cents per kilowatt hour um, and you're getting the discount once you have that 1299 mm -hmm. membership plan I think it's around like the high 30s, kind of mid to high 30s or low 40s uh, per kilowatt hour. Um, so that pays itself back after one or two charge sessions, kind of as most of these memberships do. But I think it's been an overlooked um, piece in the coverage. I mean, obviously, everyone's excited that, you know, the, the access is there and it starts to open up. But this is quite a money spinner for Tesla. If they start getting people on memberships, you're kind of 
firstly, you're locked in and a lot of people just forget, right? They're just on it and they decide to keep, you know, re-upping every month. But also you you will then gravitate towards, when we talk about usage, um, the, the first will probably be Tesla. Even if you're not thinking about the break-even point, you're going to start thinking, I'm a member of that network i know that tesla has more stalls i know that you know they're probably going to be available in a lot of these um instances so i don't know how many 4 dvs are out there right now it's got to be in the hundreds of thousands at this point right um if only half of those folks go to a membership that's one thing is a lot of money going to tesla not even thinking before you start charging but also pr probably electrify america ev go starting to lose membership revenue every month so it starts to really dilute that pool of money for people paying for fast charging right um that um, patrick live are you jumping i uh, assume you've jumped into the membership plan just because of how much charging you're doing in the last week but were you yeah, probably we should we should have. We should have. Now, now, there is one drawback to plug and charge right now. And it's like with plug and charge, we can't get the discounted rate with EA or Tesla superchargers. So a lot of times we're demoing stuff and want to show it off um, and show off the plug and charge feature. So we haven't done the membership for a while. Um, we, we did membership on EA a couple of times when we were doing longer trips, but like this past week, it's th th those videos keep getting expensive. Cause it's like, not only are we charging, we're like charging at peak rates. And I'm like, mm -hmm. this is dumb, but, um, <laughs> enjoys. uh it's, but anyways, um, it, it is something that like, it would be something to consider. And we've sort of talked about this even before we had the supercharger access. Like, I just want my, you know, like if I was an average person and I have like a couple of road trips a year, but other than that, I'm charging at home, I wouldn't even bother. You know what I mean? Um, so like a typical person in Oceanside, San Diego is like, they may go to Vegas maybe twice a year. Um, it's probably one charge there, one charge back. And it's like, do I even really want to hassle with a subscription or do I just want to be like, I'm going to go there and I'm going to plug in and it's going to work, you know? Well, so I think everybody's going to have to make their own choices. If you're, you know, especially if you're um, using DC fast charging a lot, then it makes, it's a no brainer and you will probably pick which one you're using, you know, once a week versus uh, that one that you might use once every six months. And, and I, I think we can commiserate on the uh, California energy costs anyway. So even when you're charging at home, it's not like it's cheap. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, it it was um, when we were in Colorado, we were like, people have to be crazy to go in DC fast charge because it's it's uh, like four times the cost. But there are times here, like there's some stations here that we could go hit right now, um, and it's cheaper to go DC fast charge than if I plugged in right now, which you know, no sane yeah. <laughs> homeowner does <laughs> in California. <laughs> I'm still in the benefits of a free Electrify America plan for another year, so <laughs> you know, will it be numb to that for a little while yet? But uh, I'm not the one charging to 100. percent So, so, so Steve, I could I, I I wanted to circle back for just one second um, because first of all, I wanted to say, Liv, Patrick, thank you so much for what you're doing for educating because we you'd met you started to mention Liv about some of the issues you were seeing with Tesla owners. And I've seen that as being a big gap is there's been a lot of people trying to help generally with EVs, but in terms of Tesla specific, I haven't seen a whole lot of instruction, right? And so you're sort of breaking down that barrier too, even, you know, for both Tesla owners and non-Tesla owners alike in terms of the superchargers. And it was so like funny to see David Drives Electric meet up with you. Because like he was, like I said, one of the pioneers and seeing him in Quartzsite and then all of a sudden he's showing up talking to you too. And it was so it was, it was really fun for me because he was one of the people that I was following even when I was first getting into EVs. Right. So um, and and that speaking to that sort of divisiveness as I'm seeing almost a bell curve because David really kind of reflects that original Tesla owner helping uplift all of the EV owners. We did like parallel drives with ID4s and Bolt EVs and Nissan Leafs. And he's always there trying to promote electric vehicles across the board, even though he drove a Tesla and he was using EVgo and all of these other charging charge point networks, things like that. 
And so he was that sort of old school. And I started to see more and more divisiveness as the superchargers got built up to the point where you could use them exclusively and you didn't need to use the public chargers in your Tesla. And, you know, it started to be more and more segregated. And now that we're seeing them open, I'm seeing that sort of segregation drop off and we're starting to see a more like to your point, it's a more inclusive EV community. And that's really exciting because I'm, I'm, I'm just looking forward to the point where we stop at a Tesla supercharger and you're seeing a dozen different automakers with a dozen different EVs and everybody's getting along. Right. And it's just a, it's, it's the place where we were hoping to, to be basically as, you know, EV advocates. So, um, but big, just a big thank you for you two for bridging that gap so early on and, and providing that sort of education for the Tesla supercharger experience, like I said, just across the board. So thank you. Oh, I appreciate Thanks. that so much. That's so kind of you to say. And if anyone doesn't know what he's referencing is we did a tour of the Quartzsite charging of the supercharger and we bumped into a tesla owner who was so excited to see us and we were really excited because we sort of been waiting for that like yay someone we can talk to and see how they feel and he was great and we chatted and he has a youtube channel and it turns out that eric has this long history with him and that kind of attitude um that david has is just so heartwarming and delightful and it's something that i know all of you share and that we share with our community is that excitement for this and like in, in advocating for it and educating, propelling it. So we were just as delighted to meet him. And I hope we meet more people. Like every time yeah. we drop in, we're like, hey, who's here? <laughs> this is kind of a benefit for Tesla owners as well, I think, because uh, there's been report, you know, I think we talked on the last uh, stream about people getting a little more, you know, it was just a little boring now. I, Walter, you may have brought this point up that, you know, most people are just sitting in their cars kind of eating and, you know, trying to get through the charge session and move on, um, which, you know, is, uh, you know, it's fair enough. But at the same time, it's nice to start to in get this fresh blood in, start to see a little less homogenous kind of, you know, the Model Y looks a lot like the Model 3. There's not super difference between them. You drive down line the superchargers with just Teslas. It's, you know, it's fairly standard, but now you're going to get marquees in there, lightnings. You'll start to see Rivians soon, get those Altium models in. Um, and I can see those people starting to come out. Obviously, you're going to get the the need to kind of get the Charger Dance and, you know, some of the stuff we saw in, in your videos, Patrick and Liv, you know, having to pull up to the curb, get a little bit closer. I don't know what you'll do if there's only one of you in the car to you have to have those really good uh, cameras on the car to really get <laughs> close to the curb. But, um, you know, you're going to start to get people helping each other, I think, and there's going to be a little more camaraderie, at least for a little bit here. Yeah. And if I can just interject something that you touched on about the differences of the different cars at the supercharger, they were designed for a specific purpose, which was a closed ecosystem with the Teslas, and now they're evolving into something else and it was mentioned by brandon flash i forgot where it was that as it stands now they are not nevi compliant which means there's no payment terminals uh there's no phone number to call uh should you uh need help from someone and so i guess right now we had a trajectory of the tesla supercharger which was engineered for a specific purpose that now needs to shift and i guess that there's going to be some question about whether or not once they have to support all the EVs that we were referring to and um, the ISO uh, 1511.8, as far as I know, is not in the Cadillac Lyric right now. So I need to get out of my car. And there was wording saying that I'll be able to use plug and charge at a Tesla supercharger. But right now it's not compatible. So I think there needs to be a software lift. And if there's not there, then I need to get out and I need to use an app or a payment terminal. And now the levels of complexity and added technology are going to be added on to it. I almost wonder if it might have some blowback with the reliability of them. I hope not, because uh, Tesla has definitely proven that their engineering team is world class. Um, but it's, it, they're, they're definitely going to have to change the trajectory of uh, what their mission statement was. And I'm curious to see how that's going to evolve. Um, but anyway. I, th I think that's where we want to go a little bit because, you know, it can't all be uh, happy, clappy, come by our <laughs> stuff. So, uh, it, it get can. on my, my <laughs> devil's advocate hat here. And um, so first of all, what I was talking about, you know, with the um, pulling up to the curb, that looks like a real pain in the bleep 
to be honest. I mean, you know, we, we get into this kind of, um, I remember the early days of EA, a lot of those early um, uh, hardware choices they had had short cables. People moaned about this constantly. Um, the layouts of the stalls um, kind of behind me here, you see there's in the background of that station, the one Tesla in the back there is taking up the one stall that would be useful for um, for a car which you know needs to park in an odd angle so mine's on a strange angle here um to kind of cross those chevrons and be on the last supercharger stall that you wouldn't uh need to occupy then two stalls to do it because mine my charge port is on the opposite side not the uh the tesla side in the rear um so there's going to be all this obviously and then you're going to start to get around the stall dances you know patrick obviously going through parking you know as the least going through that kind of logic of what's the least objectionable place that i could be and you know and obviously it's a good citizen thing and we want to do that but there are these um limitations on a lot of the stalls which are going to be prevalent because we can talk about v4 we can talk about um nax extension cables whatever we're going to get onto but there's there are definitely limitations to these sites um do you how do you see it going do you do you see mostly the kind of camaraderie we're going to talk about and you know people generally being willing to kind of move this forward or are we going to see more of this you know the stuff we've started to see at some electrify america locations where people are jumping queues you know there's there's the wrong kind of placement people taking up two stalls tesla owners getting mad is that a scenario you know not wanting to focus on the negative side too hard but somewhere that's that's gonna be a factor right I, I think it, I mean, it's like you're you're going to have issues at some point somewhere, and I'm sure the, the media is ready to, to pounce on that. I think for the most part, from the people that we've run into so far, granted, we haven't been to like any that are super busy, um, but everybody's been sort of just looking at it as like, we're an EV and we need to charge. Uh, so it hasn't. Like it's 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 almost like they're they're very welcoming in person and they don't see us as any different and if we need to take two spaces that's what we need to do, but the question comes is like what if we are taking two spaces and the only available space left is that one that they think is free but we're actually using, that's where I think it's going to be uh, a little bit dicey, and I think you know right now we've been sort of in that still early adopter stage. As it gets to be more common and more prevalent, I think we're going to be, you know, it's going to be like the, um, the the mall parking lot on Thanksgiving, the day after Thanksgiving, and you have just everybody from every walk of life with every type of car, you know, trying to charge. Uh, it could get pretty crazy at some point, but um, you know, our our point and our goal is to show to demonstrate the the good behavior. And I like, uh, I think it was Steve who said, we're early adapter adopters. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it's going to get crazy, right? Like, as other EVs are um, included in this, and I was sort of thinking, like, it almost feels like high school, like everyone's now going to get thrown together and see what shakes out. Um, but in all this chaos, there's definitely going to be an opportunity to learn. And I feel like since we're all going to be in it together, um, Tesla included, like maybe we will have better opportunities to learn because I'm sure most of us, I, well, I, I get stressed out if there's any queue, if there's any line and Tesla superchargers generally seem to be a little orderly, right? They seem to be quite orderly. So yeah. well, they're bigger and they're people, bigger. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I feel like maybe we'll finally get like some sort of queuing system or, or things will start to evolve to deal with this uh, in a better way. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. It, <laughs> it, it, and we, we talked about too, it's like um, we're going to try to like demonstrate like good behavior of like trying not to block to supercharger stalls, but I know a lot of Tesla owners from the V2 days, they have the mindset of like always leave a, a space. And, and we've been talking about this is like, if we, cause we were going to a supercharger and it's like four of eight in use. And I'm like, it could be they're all four next to each other and we have four spaces to choose from. Or if they're actually spread out, we may get there and go like, we can't use a single one of these chargers because they're just happen to be in the wrong spots for us. And then we might have to pull into one of the open spots and wait until that person leaves and quickly grab the cable. And then theirs looks like it's available, but it's not actually. So yeah, it could definitely get interesting, but we're definitely gonna try document it and learn the 
best ways to deal with it collaboratively with smiles <laughs> well you know I, I was going to say, Liv, your your comment reminded me of the time I, I parked in senior parking as a sophomore in high school. That that didn't go over well. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah. So I was going to say too, because I think we had made that. I we had that comment, I think, on your video too about looking for a cue, right? Because mm -hmm. that that's going to come up. And what makes what comes to my mind is, say you're you're in your Mach E and you're going up I-5 and you stop at Kettleman City. And I've seen the queues there before for Tesla. And it's like, it's a line, a single line. And when one stall opens up, the next car goes into it. But to your point, Patrick, what happens if the stall that that opens up, you can't access? So now, now what do you do? Do you wait for the next? And we've kind of already seen this a little bit with Electrify America, um, where there's only a single uh, Chatamo connector. So if you're a Nissan Leaf waiting in line, well, CCS only opens up, you're, you're still in line, right? Yeah. And so, but if you're behind someone and the next charger that opens up is the Chatamo charger, should that other person like take it or, you know, or should they let yeah. you go ahead? So there's, there's all sorts of these etiquette questions that I think are, are, we haven't seen them yet, but I do think that luckily they're only going to happen maybe on the busiest travel days. Um, and, and in my opinion, probably only at the largest sites. So, um, and that's, that's maybe my biggest uh, negative about the superchargers is fixation because we're already seeing this with electrify America too. People say, I want to go to this charger when I'm traveling and they get fixated on it. And I've had a number of trips now where I've pulled into a full Electrify America charger and I'm like, I'm not waiting in line. And I drive five minutes, maybe less and pull into an open EV go or charge point charger plug in and I'm on my way. Uh, so like that fixation on, I, I must use the superchargers. I must use Electrify America. Um, I think that's going to be the biggest negative in this, um, be be between that and trying to figure out that sort of etiquette for cues and who goes next and how do you ensure that the car that's waiting gets the next stall. So, and, and I think it, you know, that sort of, uh, is a key point because, uh, we, we talk about like these like key stations, like court site, you know, 84 stalls. And I think, um, you know, right now all across the, the intersect, the, the freeway is EA with four stalls. So it's like, I'm going to that supercharger. So I may be fixated on that. Cause like, yeah. I know we're going to have to stop and I'd rather choose that one. But where we really need to get to the point is whether it's a uh, supercharger and EV go or electrify America or supercharger and supercharger, but they have like two side by side. Cause like, you know, um, like we drove, when we drove our gas car back in the day, you would rarely pull off at the freeway interchange that had like one gas station. Cause you're like, eh, I'm going to go to the next one. Cause they have four gas stations and six, you know, places to eat, not the, the one gas station all by its lonesome. So I, you know, it's really is, it's like we are getting to better days, better spacing of, of charging stations. But what I'm really looking forward to is when you pull off uh, at interchange and you're like, well, do it, well, supercharger's there, EA is here and whatever's here, you know, and it's like, uh, I'll go to the flying J cause I, you know, I like their, their beef turkey or something. Yeah, I got to introduce you to Bucky's man. We got the Bucky's <laughs> in the Southeast and they got, they well, got weekly sponsorship up there. and Mercedes <laughs> all on their property and it's, it's, and brisket sandwiches. Right. Oh, don't forget to try the brisket. <laughs> <laughs> I think, by the way, this topic just makes me feel like for the time being, it really pays if uh, everyone is educated on other chargers on the route. So plug share, um, charge way, better wrap line or whatever it is, like just being educated on the alternatives. So if you are being routed to that Forestall EA and you get there and there are 10 people that it's not like, ah, I guess I have to get in line. It's like, there are alternatives. I know how much range I have. Yeah. Um, we, or even like us locally, we know that there are a couple 20 stall uh, Tesla superchargers that we've been using for, for videos and stuff. Um, and there are a couple eight stalls and we will never go to the eight <laughs> stalls <laughs> and they're always busy. It, and it goes back to, um, you know, as we're trying to educate people coming into EVs, it's like, um, you know, Kyle Connor, 
out of spec style of like rolling in with like 2% charging 45% <laughs> and then just, you know, burning rubber to the next one, you know, uh, I'm like, that's great. It serves its purpose. But, um, we try to, to show, like, I think anybody that's married or has a passenger, uh, you know, accompanying them on a road trip, it's like, you're going to charge the 80%. And if it gets below 10, <laughs> they're going to be looking at your, your, your mileage or your percentage left and being quite nervous. So it, then it comes into that point of like, well, this one is full, but I still have 35 miles of range. I, and there's like three other choices. Um, and I think that's how a lot of people, once we are out of the Kyle Connors <laughs> that are going to be, you know, road tripping that way. Yeah. Hi, well, and I, and I do, I do think that at least in California, we're seeing that diversity too, right? Cause you were just saying, okay, well, we have these four superchargers around us, but you know, your, your area, you've got plenty of EV go, you've got plenty of electrify America, uh, by the way, they made a great video on activation time. So go, go watch that on mock e blog. Um, but, uh, um, but yeah, I, I'm seeing a lot more of that diversity too, uh, there was a story from uh, someone who had, was in a v, VW ID4, again, Kettleman City, and there's an Electrify America and two Tesla supercharger sites, all of them full, all of them had long lines, and they drive around the corner to EV range, this small uh, charging network, and they had two open 150 kilowatt chargers, they plugged in and they were on their way in less than 20 minutes. And it's like, they were wide open people waiting in line and you have these 250 kilowatt chargers just sitting there completely unused and available. Um, or, and I, I don't even know, I guess he's a famous YouTuber Shmi or something like that. Mm -hmm. He was trying to make a point about how EVgo was vandalized and it's not like gas stations. Cause you can't just go to another EVgo If you show up, like you said, Kyle has like 3% battery, right? Well, the, the EVgo he was using was literally, 0.9 miles from a sister EV go site with the same number of 350 kilowatt chargers, the same number of stalls. And yeah. he's making this video about how you can't make it to the next charger if you show up too low. So luckily, at least in some areas, we're getting to the point where there's that diversity and that like resiliency that you don't have to just fixate. You can go to Bucky's and either charge at charge point and get your brisket or charge at the superchargers and get your brisket, but you get your brisket. <laughs> that is the um, important thing. I want to be conscious of time and covering as much as we can, because uh, I don't want to impinge on your uh, good hospitality too much. Um, but we, we touched on peak travel times. Um, and I wanted to touch on another one that you kind of hit with uh, the review of the A to Z um, adapter, I think. Um, and it's uh, the third party adapters. This could be a decision for people who maybe got in a bit late or haven't signed up yet to get their adapter. You know, if they're going to look at maybe, I think Scott Thomas is uh, a guy you know from over in um, Syracuse, New York. Um, I think he was saying his wait time is August, um, which might be enough. But, you know, if people are planning road trips for summer travel and their wait time is through to September, um, third party adapters could be an option here, right? It seems like it worked well for you guys. Um, when you were testing it versus the official adapter and we're looking at a price point of around 200 bucks is that kind of well so um you know talk if you could talk a little bit about the experience with that and also the calculus on you know if someone's way way back in line and won't get it for summer travel and they have a road trip is this something you would invest in early on just to to bridge the gap well the first thing we're going to start with is tesla and ford both have said third-party adapters are not uh, supported. So um, we we put that in our video multiple times just to make sure people are aware. But we also know, and I didn't bring the third party ad adapter because I didn't necessarily want to like uh, emphasize the third party adapters. But we we know basically how these are built inside, uh, including the, the official Tesla designed and manufactured and Ford provided adapter. They're basically they're passive. They have um, two heat uh, temperature sensors. Somebody said this one had three. I don't know why you'd have three, but it, it, you're basically monitoring uh, each side um, of the, the DC fast charging pin. So I'll put that up closer. So you're monitoring the pins. And by the way, the pins actually cross over inside. Uh, so left is right and right is left inside of each one. I mean, it's just the way they, they have to work. 
um, but it's metal. It's not wires. Um, it's formed metal and there's temperature sensors. So then if there's any uh, issue, it's going to stop charging. So um, I feel like they're, they're safe. I think they're all going to end up being certified at some point. Um, but Ford and Tesla don't support them. It, I think they are a great option for people that are like, I'm going on a road trip and, uh, you know, I don't necessarily, you know, want to wait until August or September and I need to go on a road trip now. And I'd rather have a, if nothing else, an insurance policy of having a, a backup and adapter. Um, and we've talked to the CEO of uh, A to Z and he's been like very forthcoming He's posted in like Maki form with uh, like the diagrams of like how this is designed and answers all the questions. So I'm fairly confident in it, but uh, people do need to make that that choice. Um, and we can't recommend it. Yeah, everyone yeah. has to make the decision themselves. We're just regular consumers, uh, definitely not experts in this. But there is there is one that we can definitely say do not buy. Um, <laughs> Yes, this, this smart safe nonsense, <laughs> which has got uh, active uh, DC and AC pins at the same time, and I do believe it's got some tiny little plastic flap on it that uh, is supposed to pr protect you. Um, don't go for these, please, yeah. please, please. Look to Mark Evlog, look to State of Charge with Tom Malogny, uh, right. 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 Uh, Brandon Flash, and that, that yeah. particular adapter, which is just again, no. Um, that one was uh there was a guy on linkedin who works at tesla who just posted please don't buy these you know it yeah, doesn't no. matter you're saving a hundred dollars for the safety risk you know it's in public as well it's not just you it's other people it's you know the, anyone else in the, vehicle. Down the car <laughs> yeah, the, it, the the whole it just isn't worth it. i mean there are there are occasions where it's worth maybe saving a little money and getting on the the cheaper side of a charging um accessory but this is not one of them you know there's there are safe options out there and again we're not recommending any particular third party adapter at the moment the oem is the way to go initially um but if you are gonna you know roll the dice on a third party adapter make sure it's one that's ul certified has these um you know recommendations it, of the the people who know what they're doing it, and tom malogny is going to do reviews as well we 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 did the review of the a to z we're getting we're waiting for our electron to come in um, but the, the, and the, normally like anything that's not UL certified or doesn't meet like SAE J3400 standards, I would be like, absolutely not. It's not touching my car. Cause we get, uh, offers to review a lot of EVSEs really? or EV chargers. Mm -hmm. And we're like, nope, not even going to touch it. Cause it's, it's not certified. Um, but the issue that we're sort of in now is that, uh, the SAE J3400 standard has been, uh, like the it has like a proposed finalized version, but they haven't like finalized stuff. So UL can't certify it, but it's like, once all of those are in place, I think there, I think a lot of things are going to change with third-party adapters. Um, and whether you can believe them or not, Electron and A to Z are both saying they've had talks with uh, major manufacturers, car manufacturers, uh, because I don't think everybody's going to be able to get one that looks like this because um, Tesla's, as far as we know, Tesla is the one, I'm sure they've contracted with somebody to make all of these. I don't think they're going to be able to get enough, uh, for every bolt owner and every Rivian owner and every lightning owner. So I think there are going to be some third party adapters approved and, um, hopefully it's one of those two, whoever gets like approved first. Cause like if A to Z says, you know, comes out and says, we're sell selling the brand X, but Tesla says you can't buy from A to Z directly. And you, it, like, how are they going to do that? Like, there's, mm -hmm. there's just going to be no way. But until that time, just, just be wary. Um, again, we have our video. We did some like thermal mapping of like where there was some heat on this, which was far, far less than any like anything hot. Because then he did the thermal mapping with a cup of coffee, and it was like the <laughs> same. Because initially I was like, whoa, but then coffee, it's like, oh. The, it, <laughs> it, it, I almost regret doing the thermal imaging. It's, it was really cool, and it's a little device I got for my phone. I was like, this thing is super cool, and I'm not super experienced in it. But it, it, if you look at it, you're like, oh, my gosh, there's hot spots on this adapter. Um, but this thing can be so sensitive. Like I uh, had it the other night and I sat down on the couch and then I got up. I was like, oh yeah, I have this device. And I was like, ooh, look around the room. And you could see where I had been sitting like five minutes earlier. And it was like glowing, like, <laughs> you know, 
for the untrained eye, you're like, it must have been 140 degrees, you know, <laughs> and the couch was on fire. I was like, no, I just sat there five minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. One way to measure temperature is uh, by the warmth of your backside on the couch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Cool. Well, let's uh, let's also cover really quickly um, extension cables, which was kind of a, a sundry side topic, but is potentially a solution to that cable length issue that we've uh, we've touched on. Um, you guys know charging the road, right? I'm sure. Yeah. Oh yeah. I was no say shout out to him. He's uh, a great creator, by the way, and covered like uh, the the freeze out in Chicago. Yeah, he has some Rocky really good Charger. Chicago auto show yeah. uh, videos as well. Oh yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. I always try to remember. I know I've seen kind of off on the, in your videos, and then go and check out another a channel because of it. But uh, yeah, I'm sure I've seen the road trips from uh, from right this one. Um, so yeah, but the, I think once the extension cables are released from Tesla, it should solve many issues with parking and taking up two stalls. Um, what what are we thinking you know, around the table here a little bit, Eric um, or Walter? We didn't actually cover you before. Um, what do you think about? you know, extension cables as a potential solution. It seems like an extra piece of carrot. You know, we're also already talking about adapters and more and more equipment. Is this something we want to go down the road of, or is it just a temporary solution until we get the charge port kind of and site layouts figured out? I do think it is a very elegant solution that likely Tesla had been planning for a while. The problem is the liquid cooling in the V3 cabling. They got to somehow figure out how to solve that problem, but it, solves when there's Teslas at every other stall, being able to pull up and still being able to charge a Mach-E because you've got an extension cable. Um, I do want to reverse back to the uh, third-party adapter conversation just very quickly. I worked for a company that had linemen working on power lines, and those send 1440 volts across them typically, and then you step down transformer when you get to whatever location you're at and you purchase whatever type of uh, power service you want. We're talking about some really lethal amount of electricity. And should that little alligator clip break off or not be secured uh, because it's it's not designed well, and you disconnect a CCS uh, in-progress charge, you're releasing some really lethal electricity. So, you know, the third party adapter may hurt my car, but it might put me down also. And I think that's one of the reasons why Tom is trying to head this whole conversation off because we don't want to start hurting people. And uh, definitely third party adapters is something that I'm concerned about. I saw the A to Z and it actually has my interest because as a lyric owner and a YouTube content creator, I'm trying to get able to uh, get a, um, video out once it's open for GM cars. I'm not quite sure when that's going to be and likely the adapter is going to come much later. And I've come on down on the side that I'm just going to, I'm just going to wait for the one that's official from GM. It's, yeah. it's not that important. You know, wait, Walter, so. you don't, you don't think you and I are going to get signed copies from Mary Barra. <laughs> yeah, well, she's kind of been painted into a corner about giving it to us for free at least. So I'm not quite sure yeah. exactly if we'll be, uh, if we'll be uh, treated, we're, uh, we're big program. time influencers, right? Uh, I guess <laughs> I did get a letter from Cadillac one time from my, one of my videos. I'm kind of proud of that. Uh, but the uh, extension, I think, is a elegant solution for a complicated problem that can solve many situations for the short term until the native NAX port is in the right location. And uh, considering that half of the North American market is locked with the driver's side rear. Uh, that's likely where these things are going to be put in 2025 and beyond, and then eventually prune all the other ones out. So, I mean, the only way for this extension to work is if it's private, though, right? I mean, they'd have to say, hey, Patrick, Liv, you want an, an a NAX to NAX extension cord? And you say, sure. And then you keep it in your, your frunk or whatever and use it. So, yeah. I mean, because you can't keep it at the chargers, right? Yeah. And, yeah, it's another piece you're going to carry around with you, right? Yeah. Yeah, and it's something else to make it inaccessible if someone has any uh, disability or mobility issues. It's something else that could be a challenge, but as a temporary solution. Yeah, I mean, it's complicated because it's like, uh, I think it's going to be power limited as well. I, I don't see how they could pull 500 amps through it. So it may be 350 amps which may not make that big of a deal for us. Like with a Maki, it may limit us to like 130 instead of uh, like 160 um, kilowatts peak. But um, 
it's like where we would keep it how much of a pain would it be do i really want to fuss around with it um and then even so it's sort of like knowing me like i would probably just try not to use a busy charger i'd rather use two spots at a nearly empty charger than to like get this stupid thing out and and plug it in but at the same time um you know if i if i can get one and just keep it there even if it's two or three hundred dollars i think it's going to be about 300 um because a to z is developing one that says theirs is going to be 300 but like 300 dollars is a lot but also at the same time if i'm like out in the middle of nowhere like if i'm at court site and i need to use it i'm like here we go time to use it <laughs> well, and and i mean then that's the question though to me is why does it have to be that j3400 to j3400 it seems to me that it would make more sense as a ccs1 right because what cars are going to need a tesla adapter to get a tesla plug to reach a tesla socket that's the yeah. that's the question i have so yeah that's a good well and, and so i thought the same thing and i'm like i think it might be because they're figuring the connector would be smaller um and the the tesla connector is elegant but like if i'm like doing an extension cable i wouldn't mind having something this big and beefy versus the yeah. little you know what i mean it's, it's like i rival the old uh, franken cable yeah the uh, yeah there you go <laughs> It's, it's actually it must be a good uh, adapter video though i know brandon's done one of those on you know adapter through to an adapter through to another adapter and you add extension cords to this and that's a hell of a, <laughs> hell of a monstrosity gold rudberg thing um <laughs> so i want to be conscious of time uh, we always go late so that's uh, not on a uh, problem for us but if you guys need to hop off at any point um just let me know because you know i know people uh, have questions for you but if you need to head off then that's all good Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, we, we we're doing actually a uh, uh, electric vehicle association meeting, monthly meeting. So uh, they 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 wanted us to come in as the guest speakers, and we are the uh, electric vehicle association um, road tripper EV, EV road, road tripper. Yeah. Ambassador, are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> EV road trip ambassadors of the year. So it's like, yeah. And this was before all the uh, supercharger videos. Oh, so yeah. Yeah. Goodness yeah. knows what you're going to win next year. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, yeah. Well, thank you so much for for joining us. Uh, obviously, it's uh, really appreciated, and uh, you've got back to back meetings here, so we appreciate your time. And you can go through the comments. There's uh, more and more people that are saying exactly the same thing. Thanks for all your efforts. We really appreciate it. That's yeah, such a pleasure. You. So glad we could be here, and I love that we're all excited about this. Yeah, <laughs> let's uh, find some events to get to. I uh, need to connect with you all. Yeah. Yeah. Fest. Everybody, come out Long Beach. April it's 13th. one month from today. Yeah. Like I said, I've got one one year left on my free charging, so it's going to happen in the next ten to twelve months. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right. Awesome. Thanks so much, Go. Is there anywhere we can um, send folks to to check out the EV Association thing? Or? uh i think it's yeah. just a local chapter there's a zoom meeting um so i think it's eva of san diego if you google it they you may be able to still register um, yeah if you want to drop anything in the comments go ahead we'll hang out for another 10 or 15 minutes finishing up here so anything you want to direct people to feel all free. all right i'll see if they have a public page yeah i'll see if we can find it and we'll, we'll drop it in sweet okay. thanks so much again all right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be watching. Bye, guys. Cheers. Ooh. Good night. Bye. Bye. So, just to emphasize, you can uh, follow and subscribe with Patrick and Liv at uh, Maki Vlog on YouTube. And uh, there's more than enough videos to check out right after this one if you've got some time on your hands. Um, so, we'll finish up. We're not uh, not right at time here, but um, I wanted to touch on it. it the video dropped just before uh, this, and I think it was either you i can't remember who forwarded it to us but uh a few comments in the um live chat about uh jim farley talking to tom malogny and uh you know had, had to begin to talk malogny obviously everyone uh, knows patrick and live but uh if that's the case then we certainly all know tom at state of charge and uh, did a great interview with uh, jim farley kind of shed a, a light on uh, you know a few things from uh the agreement and how it kind of came about um Walter, did you get a chance to watch this? Did you have any kind of comments on, uh, you know, what was revealed in the uh, the exchange there? I did, and it dispelled the myth of some kind of backroom negotiation 
uh, where they were planning some maniacal dominance or it, it was just practicality. He had been traveling on the road with his kids and his kids kept pointing out the superchargers right there and we couldn't charge at them. And it, it kind of enlightened him to the reality of the situation. And he decided to take a path to change the course of uh, Ford. And as a result, the rest of the North American OEMs and uh, people who sell cars in North America as well. It was it, truly a telling moment for EV enthusiasts because the implications, ramifications of opening of the Tesla supercharger, I don't think can be understated. There's there's many things that is going to cascade through, not only within the EV community, this is all getting press, and now EVs are getting elevated and com uh, being brought back into conversations again, and it's just going to fuel higher adoption rates, more people joining. They're like, oh, well, now we can charge at superchargers. That's pretty cool. And so I, it's just a win-win for everyone. It's just really terrific. Well, you know, Walter, just to that point, because we didn't bring this up, Steve, when we were talking with Liv and Patrick, and, and maybe we should have. Um, but I know that over the years, I, I've seen a lot of ignorance within the EV community, but then ex especially outside of the EV community in terms of in terms of charging. And that's one of the things that, you know, they were doing such a great job educating um, because here you have a CEO of a major automaker that's building EVs. And even he was kind of like, wait a minute, that's right. We can't use these. And it's like, imagine what the average consumer who hasn't purchased an EV yet thinks right and and we saw this with tesla owners where i would see posts from tesla owners where they're taking a picture of a ccs1 cable and saying what is this and why doesn't it fit my car and why can't i use this it looks like an electric car charger but i can't use it why not so there's this just general ignorance um within i think the whole market and i don't think mainstream media is doing really anything to address it no. um and and so this opening of the superchargers and like you said it's just practicality and i think the word that jim farley used was mission driven he felt like any any company that's mission driven to build evs it just makes sense to have a universal charging standard get sae involved make it happen make everybody make it so everybody can use the same chargers and there's no hurdles to adopting evs at that point so I, th I thought there are a couple of takeaways from it. I mean, first of all, it's kind of what we we knew already from the um, you know the coverage over the last six to twelve months that the the data was pointing him in that direction, right? The numbers that came out were um, you know they've they've got a guy called Doug Fields there who was former Tesla and was pegging the, um, the port success, you know, first time success of connecting to the superchargers at that ninety eight ninety nine percent level, which is you know what we want to see that's what we're targeting if 97 percent isn't good enough then we're probably looking at 99 99.5 um and that's actually the number that rivian um rivian ceo rj scarringe uh, put out in uh you know when they're talking about the the kind of uptime that they want to see and the kind of success rate really because it's different between the charger being up and the you know customer experience being successful when they connect but there were you know the numbers for the public network which wasn't directed at EA, but was quite clearly, that's what he was talking about, uh, was at 70%. So clearly there you've got the massive gap. Um, now this is at a time when I think you and I, Eric, were talking about more like we're seeing closer to 90%. Like I've never had a point where I've been below 90% personally in my experiences, but again, that's there's potential for user error in there. Um, but the other piece of it was anecdotal and it was this, I want to get your take Eric purely because it was a, a road trip from Monterey, California to Lake Tahoe. And I'm sure you've seen that route. Um, probably should have got Patrick and live on that but as well, but how we could talk to them for hours. Um, so, but that was him, you know, going along that route and his kids saying, can we use that one? And no, it's a Tesla supercharger, but I'm, I feel like that would actually be a covered route. Would it not? I mean, are you not? California's got a good number of charge, maybe not two years ago, but even then. It I is, it, yeah, it is. And it is now it's, and I think the bigger issue might've been that, um, well, one Tesla sites just look so much more impressive, right? When you have 10, 15, 20, 30 stalls compared to 
two, three, four, five stalls from other charging providers. Um, the, the route is covered, but it's not covered as well as you would think it should be. Um, and as I recall from Farley's trip, he was, he was stopping primarily at Electrify America. So there are other options, uh, but it just so happens that the Electrify America chargers they were using were co-located with superchargers. And so it's like, here we are waiting for six chargers at Harris Ranch. Maybe one of them doesn't work. Maybe the 350 kilowatt charger is only outputting 100 kilowatt because <laughs> BTC power maybe. But, you know, so his kids are there and they're looking across at 1820 supercharger stalls that are just wide open. Why can't we use those? Well, you, you just can't. So my understanding of that trip is it wasn't that he couldn't make it. It was just that how much more enhanced it would be by having access to those superchargers or how much better it would be if he also had access to those superchargers. So it really does come down to this point from Leonard, you know, for years we've had drivers come up to charges they can't use. All cars should just work with all chargers. Um, now we're still got to point out that there's still a year, probably more like two years here of a lot of confusion. You know, this isn't just going to go away, you know, once everyone gets an adapter, it's going to actually go the other way because there's going to be confusion at uh, superchargers over who can use what and how to use the adapter and who's supposed to be in which store. We've covered that. Um, on the other side, I mean, I almost think for my travel this year, you know, it could actually make it quite a lot better because, I mean, there's still going to be your EA crowd of ID4s and, you know, uh, Ionic 5s kind of like, and Ionic in general gathering towards these EA sites. But, um, you know, we've got the kind of stuff that Walter's covered in his travels of, you know, this expanding pilot flying J, the Mercedes Benz high power charging network, and a lot of these starting to go in the ground. I'm seeing just a lot of stuff open up on this route across to Ohio, even, you know, for me, where there's even more options than there were before. And it was always quite open, even on Electrify America. Um, and now we're going to have some of those EA sites and the EVgo sites emptied out of the Fords and the Rivian, well, Rivian to the extent that they were out there and using them anyway, um, some of the GM vehicles potentially. Um, so this could actually be, at least not in revenue sense, but certainly for you know the driver experience, this could give stuff like Electrify America especially a chance to just stand back, take a breather and figure out where the investment needs to go now how they can make that network something that is usable well and you know to that point too steve because like you mentioned our experiences do not seem to be reflective of what we're seeing in mainstream media or what we're seeing getting trumpeted around in certain areas of social media well, and also just you know to whilst we're on the topic and i'll you know stop in a sec here but the the trip that uh, kyle and tom just did down the east coast you know it was exactly what i would expect to see they, you know they got absolutely hammered in the comments beforehand that you're not going to make it tom and it was utterly uneventful finish within a few minutes of each other you know it's exactly as our trips have been right yeah it, yeah and and yeah that's the thing is it was like it's that is what i have come to see as my experience um but what i think there's there's might be a very subtle side benefit with this based on your point steve and that is that we could be seeing the wind taken out of the sails of a lot of these FUD based articles and stories where, oh, I tried to do an EV road trip and I couldn't make it. And it's like, well, I just did that trip and I, I have no problems or I had no problems. So now if the people who are having issues with Electrify America are only using Tesla, right, they're only going to use the superchargers. Well, that eliminates a huge volume of that FUD that we're seeing spread around where maybe it was just user error. Maybe it was a compatibility issue with that specific automaker or their payment plan or whatever it happened to be. And those of us who either are just more experienced EV owners uh, leveraging these other options are going to have these uneventful trips. And the people who are still having issues they have an alternative where if they can't get a Tesla supercharger to work, well, we have hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of EV owners that will tell you they work just fine. So where is, where is this issue? Whereas Electrify America, EVgo ChargePoint don't really have that clout or backing of this large population of EV owners who are saying they work fine for us. 
So why aren't they working for you rather than, oh, they just suck, right? Like, so. Yeah. And there was, yeah. there was a Wall Street Journal report where they talked about the changing tides of the introduction of the superchargers, which is, as you say, a reversal of the FUD engine out of the Wall Street Journal. And uh, very well, maybe, as you say, positive news can have a really far reaching cascading effect on EV adoption. Yeah. And if I can, I just want to back up. Uh, Leonard mentioned in the comments, and I apologize, I'm not uh, tied into the ability to post into chat right now about loves and what the chargers may be there. With options that we're looking at, I'm getting a spidey sense feeling that they're going to be an IANA partnership. They've got so many Nevi awards and they've done nothing and they have to be doing nothing for a reason. Um, my personal opinion is that they already have a partnership getting ready to be announced with the IANA and uh, that will likely be the interstate corridor uh, locale for them. This is pure speculation on my part. Uh, but as far as what type of hardware they use, they could be the new silicon carbide uh, power modules in the chem power, able to boost up to uh, 400 kilowatts or uh, Alphitronic. Uh, it could also be Tesla superchargers uh, that they put into their property. Uh, so really anyone's guess there, but it's going to be very interesting to see why Loves is doing nothing with all these locations in Pennsylvania, they've got many awards, got many awards in uh, Texas, uh, many awards uh, throughout all Nevi state announcements, and they, they have not done a build yet. So th this is definitely something to watch. And there's no way to parse those award statements for what prospective hardware they're going to put in or anything like that. Some some of the uh, awards have mentioned them. Others are really just location based or brand based. Um, but I'm going to pay specific attention to loves. I've been trying to kind of put together uh, spreadsheets on the the overall Nevi program, so I'm going to try and keep an eye on that. But okay. um, yeah, it's it's tough to say. But I mean, the the Iona thing, I think we're on the cusp of something pretty. There's going to be announcements pretty soon here. I mean, there's been quiet for a month. Um, I'm expecting to, if not have you know confirmation of. Um, hardware and the details i think we're going to start to hear about where they want to go you know what kind of locations they're going to hit um we've already got some confusion though with the you know i, I think the the nevi piece is interesting because it's going to cover the country you know first of all right the the alternative fuel corridors and the travel routes that's the priority because they can't spend the rest of the money until they've at least on a state by state basis covered their designated alternative fuel corridors um, so they're going to have to do that. But I think you'll start to see a doubling up. Um, the only thing is there won't necessarily be Nevi funds available. It depends what the state decides is important. But there's nothing to say that they can't then go back and Iona come in and say, well, okay, Pilot Flying J had this one. Love still wants to put one in because, you know, if they're opposite them, they still want to have a competing facility. Um, there's nothing to say they can't get Nevi funds for that as well. I mean, it's kind of an overlap, yeah. but in the in the pattern that CPOs have been following is that they're not relying just on Nevi funds. Le Nevi funds are just kind of opportunistic, and the lion's share of their builds are privately funded. You look at yeah. Circle K with the one award that they received and broke ground on in Kentucky. That's okay. That's one, but they've got 50 other locations that they footed the bill for. Uh, Pilot Flying J similarly. So Loves has got all these Nevi awards and their private purse as well and we have seen absolutely nothing from them um it's, it's gonna be hitting here pretty soon i'm imagining yeah we're opening the betting lines right <laughs> well iona is definitely on people's uh, minds but i think it's kind of it's one of these the ebbs and flows right it goes in uh big announce or big you know news breaks and then we get nothing and then i think they're just trying to put all their pieces in order you know they only got uh, put together as a, an official organization in February. So I know people want to see, you know, full maps and all the pins in it and start to sleuth on plug share, but uh, we'll have to wait a little bit. Um, all right. So kind of off the high of uh, Ford Tesla adapters, I think we've covered what we wanted to. We didn't even touch on Rivian, except for mentioning that was the one video that wasn't about Ford and uh, Tesla <laughs> in uh, Patrick and Liv's lineup. Um, I'm super excited about that. I don't know how much longer we want to go here, but I think that is just the next level. I've I've loved Rivian 
since you know first seeing the r1t at fully charged live in austin a few years ago and it's out of my uh you know a little bit rich for my blood at the moment but 45 grand for the r2 is what caught my eye but uh what are you thinking briefly on the r3 and the r3x well i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna out myself and say that i didn't actually follow it just yet i figured i would let the dust settle and and catch up so um but 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 like you rivian is a bit above my pay grade so i'll i'll just watch with envy for now this is going to be cheaper than my ionic five so (laughs) it stays at forty five thousand. that is (laughs) yeah there was a quiet announcement kind of in the back chatter that they won the contract for CP, which is Canadian Post, for their next generation vehicle as well. So the churning out of Amazon delivery vans had kind of been <clears throat> petering out and they were left to stand on their own, but then they got the CP contract. And apparently CP is going to put in 50% electric by 2030, I think it is. And those are going to be based on Rivian chassis that will be passed off to another company that does the actual uh, metal work for the framing. So that was very encouraging also because I actually had there were some concerns about them pulling back from the Georgia project uh, about their financial viability. But then they announced these three, <clears throat> they got the CP contract, so they seem to be in it for the long term. They also just opened a nine stall Rivian Adventure Network location in Daytona Beach, Florida. So they're still going strong there as well. So the company definitely seems vibrant and a, a, a long term player. And those are supposed to be open too, right? To the public. Yeah, so, uh, and so point. Said, this is going to be, I mean, what they said, second half of 2024, which I think we yeah. covered up the last time could be 12th of, or, you know, 31st of December, 2024, uh, hopefully earlier, because I'd like to give them some of my cash as well. Um, all of bouncing all over the place here, but I want to make a quick mention because Eric mentions Massachusetts, which is also my home state, uh, awarded grants a couple of years ago, but few stations have been built, much less operating. Yeah, that's the um, Mass EVIP uh, program, which got updated in January. There's, It's been a real um, slow burn, and there's a lot of sites that have uh, dropped off, but they are starting to open them. They put a bunch of revised dates, uh, and a lot of them are in May to October. Um, so you'll start to see some of them. Some of the sites around Greater Boston have opened up, um, but there's going to be a bunch of others that will go in. I think they've got serious about that now, so definitely take a look at the January update on that, and I'll try and do a video at some point very soon on it. Um, and also for anyone in Massachusetts or heading this way, the um, Alex Fire America six stall site in Lee, Massachusetts, which is over in the Berkshires, is now open as of today, which is a super important site because previously it was the big gap of about 70 miles or so between uh, Electrify America's first site in the middle of the state and Albany, New York. So that is going to be a big one. Really nice place to stop. And six stalls hopefully will be enough for the foreseeable future here. Steve, can I pull up one comment, though, that I saw way back in the day? So there is a Nissan Leaf adapter for CCS now. Now, again, we can't condone it. We can't sanction it. But, um, yeah, there is one that's that's being made, and uh, someone's already tested it um, here. And so, yeah, it's uh, it's working. So, um, yeah, the, it is actually an option. It's a little bit expensive. Um, and uh, it's uh, um, the it, Nomadic Hippie is the uh, is the YouTube channel where he's actually testing it out. So he actually has one and it's been working on his Nissan Leaf, at least uh, preliminarily. So it looks like it still has some issues and needs some firmware, but um, it is something that can be ordered at this point. And it adapts CCS1 to Chatamo, which I think is actually a big deal. So, yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, this will be the last thing we discuss, I'm afraid, but um, the I think that's important. We are going to start to see Chatamo fade away now, I think, especially with the focus on, you know, the, the remaining standards. But it, it kind of also emphasizes how long it's going to take for CCS to, to fade away because people are saying, like, well, it'll be gone by next year. I mean, there's still Chatamo installs going in now. You know, it's this Chatamo hasn't died on the vine you know, within three years of uh, or four years of the Nissan area confirming that Nissan would move to CCS, which was the only manufacturer really supporting it. So, you know, it's not going to be that long now before CCS starts to 
you know, there may be, on, you know, J3400 only installs, but it's going to be around for a good long time. Um, it's, it, you know, because all this, it happens two years, three years in advance, right? So all the sites that have been planned are going in now, still going to be going in for another year, two years, and those are all planned before this was new. So there's a lag factor of a good couple of years here between the things that were planned in, you know, first half of January or first half of 2023, and all those will start coming online 2025. And there's going to be people saying in the comments, well, why the hell are they, you know, putting in CCS plugs, you know, in 2025? Well, this was planned two years ago and, you know, there's still a lot of people making these things. So that's where we're at with that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think we're good. Anything parting wisdom, Walter, anything you want to kind of, I mean, you've been out even on uh, new um charging sites and operators as we could cover an entire episode with the places you've been it's eric's uh, private network apparently yeah they put it on the wrong coast <laughs> <laughs> you can what now charge miss? yeah you missed the news about Coolum. yeah yeah it's my it's it's my side my, my side gig my side yeah. you can Snuck go to walter's there. channel for anyone who's just baffled at this point and uh, needing coffee or you can go to walter's channel whilst you drink your coffee and watch the update on the coolum charges down in north carolina yeah all right so thank you everybody for joining another good one i'm glad we could have uh patrick and liv tell us about the uh the news and um the next one hopefully we will be talking about level two charging we'll leave all this uh pomp and circumstance of dc fast charging behind and start to get down to the curbside with some uh, interesting folks in the destination charging space so stay tuned for that one and uh we'll see you in another one thanks for joining us all right cheers everybody thank you. Okay. bye